I am exhausted. It's been a very long month. There's been a lot of work stuff. There's been a lot of family stuff. There's been a lot of household stuff. And juggling all of these things, I've just not had the time to make the videos I want to make in the way I want to make them. So my apologies. But even now, we are at the end of this week and we're in the middle of a five-day festival. Uh, I haven't gotten to make a video. So I thought rather than go another week with no upload at all, I thought we could take a maybe a little more casual approach. Recently in one of my unboxing videos, as well as a live stream I attended over on Highland G's channel, I've mentioned comics art and the comics art collection I have and people asked to see a little bit of that. Now I don't have a whole lot and much of what I have is in portfolios, but I do have some stuff that's up on the walls and I really like having comics art up on the walls. Just to quickly note, when I say comics art, I don't mean only original art. I just mean comics related images. So on my walls, I have everything. Cheap printouts, posters that I have purchased, images that I found online and blown up to put on the walls, as well as, yes, some comics original art in the form of a couple of sketches, some panels, some pages. So join me in this low-key episode of For the Love of Comics, taking a look at some of the comics art on our walls. Wall 1 contains printouts and posters. There's no original art here. And the reason why all of them are together on this wall is because this has the most sunlight of all the walls I put art on. And obviously you don't want direct sunlight. And even over here, it'll be curtained. But because there is sunlight that comes in here, I obviously don't want to put anything that is pencils or inks over here. Even these posters will fade over time, I suppose. But that's the way it goes. On the left side, we have a printout of Fables. It's an image from Fables that I really liked and I just got a color printout and got it framed cheaply in the neighborhood. And that's the same with this New Yorker cover by Dan Klaus. Printout frame thing was given to me by a friend who also gave me another one that we'll see later. And then we have this large Summer Blonde poster. Summer Blonde is a collection of pieces by Adrian Tomina, which were originally published in Optic Nerve. And this is the hardcover. It has a dust jacket with a hole that only shows the face of this girl over here. I've taken the dust jacket off for this. But I love this image. I love this poster. I was buying something from the Drawn and Quarterly website and I saw that they had this for about $10. So I threw it on top of my order and got it framed at a neighborhood framing store. The same pattern continues for the rest of the wall. We have one printout and one poster. The printout over here is quite a high quality printout and it again belonged to a friend of mine. This is the cover of American Splendor number four, drawn by Robert Crumb and showing Robert Crumb and Harvey Picar in a trade there, uh, both thinking they are getting the better end of it and the other person's a sucker. That's sort of the joke about collectors. And I really love this cover. I love American Splendor. I've collected all of the issues of them. This is one of my favorites. And my friend actually had this printout and got himself an upgraded printout like on uh, with archival inks on very high quality paper. And I was very happy to have his cast offs. This is just a poster of Day Tripper, but I bought this from Gabriel Ba and Fabio Moon, when they were visiting the New Delhi Comic Con, they've autographed it right at the bottom for me as they autographed my old tattered paperback. Day Tripper is one of my favorite comics. I love it. I've made a couple of videos on it. And this is really a memento of meeting the creators behind it. Moving on to wall two, a narrow passageway between uh, the door and the living room, we've got some original art. This is from Rick Geary's Beast of Chicago, and these two are panels from Matt Kent's Three Story, The Secret History of the Giant Man. I love Rick Geary, I love The Beast of Chicago. I mentioned it in a couple of early videos of mine. This is one of my favorite Rick Geary comics, and Rick Geary is one of my favorite writer artists in comics. And one of the things that really hooked me about this comic was the map of the house right at the beginning of it. This really haunted me, getting me primed for it by showing me this insane house. So when I was able to purchase this directly from Mr. Geary himself, uh, this is one of the only probably examples of something that made such a deep impression on me that I went out and hunted for it and was lucky enough to find it available. This is the map of the second floor of the Holmes Castle where a whole bunch of serial killing took place. The original page seven of The Beast of Chicago by Rick Geary. 
And I have a lot of Matt Kint art because a lot of his art is sold in this panel form rather than being full pages. He paints them on separate pieces of card and then they're assembled into a page. This is from Three Story, The Secret History of the Giant Man, recently out in this new paperback edition. A lovely story and one of my favorite Matt Kent stories. Probably one of his most emotional and personal feeling works in spite of its speculative nature. Now, unfortunately, this wall is going to be a little difficult to shoot because it's in this narrow passageway. So you'll have to forgive the handheld camera. This is a convention sketch by Fabio Moon, who I met at Delhi Comic Con, as I was saying. He asked me what I wanted. I said Sherlock Holmes because I'd read online that they were Sherlock Holmes fans, the brothers. So I thought that was a little geeky thing to do. And that's what he created for me. Next to it is a color rough by Richard Sala for Cat Burglar Black. I love Cat Burglar Black. I love Richard Sala. I got to purchase this directly from Mr. Sala himself. One of my favorite pieces I own, of course. This over here isn't a comics page or sketch. This is actually an animation cell. I don't know whether it was used as a keyframe, but it's drawn and autographed by Karl Barks, who I love. This is something I was really happy to find on eBay. It wasn't cheap, but it wasn't as expensive as I thought it should be. It came in this frame and it's uh, another one of my crown jewels. Down here we have another couple of Matt Kint pieces. I found these in a lot, but I've never been able to identify which comic they're from. I think I even sent Matt or Charlene a mail asking about that, but never heard back. And here is another convention sketch by David Lloyd of V. David Lloyd was at the same Comic-Con that Moon and Ba were in. In fact, so was Mark Wade and John Lehman. One of the highlights of my very brief and limited convention attending life. And we'll continue with the handheld as we squeeze down this narrow passageway for a couple more pieces right here. We have a couple of pages from Auli. This is from volume two or volume three, A Little Blue. And these two pages are one of my favorite sequences in comics. It's just so well done without any words, but it's so clear about how this birdhouse is being installed and how the friends are helping each other getting this done. There's a slow zoom, there's a movement to the right. I love these two pages next to each other. Once again, I was able to purchased this directly from Andy Rondon of his website. And I was thrilled to have this example of comics art on my walls, blue pencils and all. And then keeping with the all ages classics, this is from Little Robot. I guess this is Little Robot's first appearance and uh, the first time the robot appears in the comic. Of course, this is by Ben Hatke, who did the wonderful Zeta, the Space Girl series. Little Robot is a standalone single volume work that I really enjoy. Once again, purchased directly from Mr. Hartke from his Etsy shop. I don't know if he still has that up. I'm very happy to have this. And I also have a couple of Zeta the Space Girl pages, but they're in a portfolio. And the last couple of pieces up on the walls. This is a page from Matt Kint's Mind Management, written and drawn by Matt Kint. A wonderful watercolor page showing two of our protagonists arriving in Zanzibar, a pretty important scene early on in the story, but I got this page because I love the way it transitions from within the plane, day into night and landing, moving across characters, location and time. Wonderfully economical, wonderfully expressive. I'm a big fan of Matt Kent, as if that isn't already obvious to regular viewers of this channel. I loved getting this signed page from him, again, directly from the artist himself via his website. And finally, tucked high above a bookshelf in a shaded, as shaded a corner as I can find, is a page from Darwin Cook's The Spirit. This is from the Maneater story. This is, I think, issue number four of Darwin Cook's revival of uh, the classic Will Eisner strip. I thought it was a fantastic revival. Obviously, I'm a big fan of Darwin Cook's, and honestly, who isn't? And I was very happy <laughs> to use up my entire bonus for one year to be able to get this pencil page. This is 
I think a long time ago and it wasn't as expensive as Darwin Cook art now is, but I didn't get this as an investment or anything like that. I love this page. I love the fact that you can look at it and see them watching TV, probably hearing something on the radio. She says, you don't go anywhere. You're having dinner with me. He writes a note, sorry. Uh, the, the entire storytelling in this is so beautiful, so economical. And with this, pencils and blue pencils combination. I just I just fell in love as soon as I saw it. There were a number of other pages by Cook available at that time, but they were all extremely expensive, probably because they were Parker or superhero comics, etc. This one was underrated. I love the spirit. I think this is a fantastic page and I'm really happy to have it on my walls.